Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, another thank you for your patience. My name is Marwa Mohkam and I'm thrilled to be welcoming you all today. I speak on behalf of LUMS when I say that nothing makes us happier than opening our arms to the wider community for opportunities of collab collaborative learning like this. And uh, we'd like to extend our deepest thanks first to the Aga Khan University for so graciously hosting us today. A special thank you first to Dr. Tashmin Khamis and Professor Anjum Halai and the quality uh, teaching and learning team at AKU for their support in bringing us together. And a little bit about now why we're here. The acclaimed poet and philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, Shall I tell you the secret of a true scholar? It is this. Every person I meet is my teacher at some point, and in that, I learn from them. And when you think about it, isn't that what true learning is all about? Understanding the idea that we actually always can be learning if we're open to the possibility of it. So as we come together this afternoon for this kind of one-of-a-kind learning, let's just take a moment to celebrate what brings us together. And what is that? the quest for knowledge and discovery. And let's keep hoping that this continues to pave the way for all the opportunities still on our horizon. To give you a little background, especially because of this logo that you may have seen, Disrupted Ideas That Matter is one such opportunity that we at LUMS are very excited to have collaborated on with Jazz, who share our passion for creating innovative and exceptional learning environments in Pakistan. Because of this and because of these collaborations, we're very lucky to be hearing from some very esteemed members of our global community today. So please do join me in giving them all the welcome they deserve. And without further ado, I'd like to invite the person that really drives all that we do at LUMS. Please join me in welcoming our LUMS Vice Chancellor, Dr. Arshadan. Thank you, Marwa. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And I'd like to also um, apologize on behalf of the delay, but also thank you very much for your patience, uh, especially to those who are standing in the back, uh, don't have a seat. Uh, really appreciate you being here with us this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I'd, write, I'd like to be blunt, if I may, in uh, beginning my remarks from a sort of a helicopter view and, and say the following that the Pakistani education system is a broken system. Uh, schools, as you know, are desperately uh, trying to keep up with a tsunami of young students coming into the system. And the numbers, if you just think about the size of the numbers, they are staggering. Uh, for instance, we have 25 million young people who do not finish primary education. Uh, they are the sons and daughters of uh, 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 illiterate parents, uh, and these students are multiplying in the millions from one school district to another school district across the country. Of course, the weakest link in the system are these formative years of primary schooling. And so we can say, if we look at education as a whole, that we neglect this part of our education system more than any other part, which is the K-5 to years. Uh, and uh, a lot of damage is done because most students drop out. And what happens as a result is that this impact cascades not only within the education sector all the way to uh, high school and to colleges and universities, but it cascades through the nation as we have people who did not get the opportunity, the right, uh, to be uh, educated. So as for post-secondary education, in the, if we look at the uh, sectors that we work in, at Aga Khan and at LUMS and, and all the other universities that are here in this, represented in this room, um, during the last 15 years, I'm told that the numbers have uh, increased a lot. And the numbers uh, I learned from the Higher Education Commission uh, conference day before yesterday are something like uh, um, 250,000 students uh, in the 200 universities that we have in the country 
and that is a 15 fold increase um, over the period of last 15 years. But again, you know, this is a country of 220 million people. So if you even look at the uh, uh, higher education sector, we're talking about a 0.001 percent, uh, a dot in in this uh, uh, universe where we don't really do that well. Even in that sector, I would argue that we don't do a very good job in terms of teaching. Uh, but I think the bigger story, and the reason that so many of you are here today, uh, is that um, we don't know much about learning. Uh, we need to learn about learning, because each one of us, if you're a parent, uh, no matter what your age is, you value learning. But <clears throat> we don't know much about it. And so perhaps the first question we should ask is, well, who does know about it? Who are the experts who can give us some insights about learning? And the answer is really not that difficult because we do have experts who study and think and spend their lives uh, about learning. And these experts are cognitive scientists, they are neuroscientists, they are educational psychologists, and there are practitioners who have gained expertise in understanding pedagogy. Now, imagine for a moment that we took the most important lessons from these experts and we put together some courses that would help students to understand how they learn. Furthermore, uh, suppose these courses provided really practical and useful insights and techniques that would help them as learners, irrespective of their age, to succeed in challenging subjects like math and physics and um, for that matter, any subject that appeared difficult for them. And now here's the good news. Such courses exist. One of them has taught millions of students, and that course uh, is Learning How to Learn. It's the world's most su subscribed online course, and it is in demand because, well, there's no other course like it. Um, <clears throat> Two and a half million students have taken the course to date, and I'm told that over a thousand students enroll in this course every single day. So what does this course really teach you? <clears throat> well, it addresses challenging problems that students face. Uh, let's take a couple of these very quickly. One of them is a problem not only students face, but I think everybody faces, and that is procrastination. Procrastination, if you think about it, <laughs> has a lot of severe long-term consequences. For students, it leads to cramming, leads to memorization, and that reduces, of course, success in learning. But do we ever sit back and give students insight as to how we should manage procrastination? I think you could say the same thing about nutrition. You could say the same thing about exercise. You could say the same thing about, um, well, sleep. Um, these are critical elements in the learning process. And yet, we don't really know why they're really that important. We just know they're important. And I think one lesson we've learned about pedagogy is that you just can't tell students what to do. You can't tell your children, just go to sleep. They have to understand why that is important. And here again is some good news. We know, now we know why. Uh, we can show students what is happening inside their brain when they uh, are, in fact, say, practicing, or when they take uh, a break for refreshments, or, or for that matter, when they sleep. So we have these techniques, uh, space repetition, avoiding cramming, deliberate practice. There are so many techniques that, are, that make a demonstrable difference in the students' learning outcomes. And yet, you know, again, if you think back, for all the formal years that ask yourself whether well, you've been educated, uh, for, all those, for all the formal education, uh, you never had the opportunity to really learn how uh, you could learn. And that, I believe, we can change right now. We can move into the future by providing our students training on a massive scale by reaching directly to them and, of course, to their teachers. We can reach them with very high quality materials to convey the best about what we know from research about how students learn effectively. And I think it's time we reached out directly to students 
with courses that will be immensely helpful, of course, to their teachers who will find it easier to convey those challenging topics in mathematics and physics and uh, to promote deeper understanding. And this, ladies and gentlemen, brings me to introduce to you our speaker for this afternoon, our keynote speaker, Dr. Barbara Oakley. Now, uh, if you look at Barbara's history, a lot has been written about her. There's YouTube videos and, of course, her famous course. Uh, but, you know, if you look at her trajectory, you'll see that her innovations began in the classroom, as, uh, uh, as many of us experience as teachers. But then she went to another level and she said, some of the stuff that I've learned in the classroom, I want to share with a larger audience. And she did that with what was uh, very common at the time that she did it, which is to write a book about it. And that was a mind for numbers. And that book became actually the source material for the massive open online course, uh, which you have all heard about. And if you read the kudos about her work, you can read the most recent Wall Street Journal uh, article, which describes her work as revolutionary. Uh, because she has this amazing ability to simplify some very complex intersection of neuroscience and of social behavior. And if I may say this, if universities are Goliaths, well, Barbara is uh, the David. Um, that may not be the appropriate uh, thing to say here right now, but uh, I'm not sure what the translation of that, of the Goliath and, and David is, maybe Jaluth and I don't know who David would be, but that's Barbara. Shukriya. <laughs> Shukriya. Now, why do I give the, uh, you know, this particular uh, Goliath and why, why am I saying this? Well, I'm saying this because I've spent some time in Canada. And in Canada, the largest university is the University of Toronto with about 90,000 students. And they have about 600,000 alumni. Now, any one of these folks who have been at the University of Toronto, um, well, you know, you'd say that they have a huge impact in Canada just because of the numbers. But if you look at Barbara's course, she has had three and a half times more students than any student ever who's taken any course at the University of Toronto. So in a way, Barbara is bigger than the University of Toronto. <clears throat> now, when I saw Barbara at work in Amsterdam, uh, when she was giving a keynote, I said, can you come over to McMaster, which is a, at that time I was working there, and she did, and she made her second MOOC there called Mind Shifts. And then a few years later, I said, um, Barbara, I'm going to Lahore, would you mind coming to Lahore? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here she is, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You can't stop Barbara when she sees an opportunity to help other people. Um, especially when I told her a bit about Pakistan's demographics, uh, one of the youngest countries in the world, she did something incredible. I haven't seen uh, a colleague do in my long career as an academic. She simply said, look, I have some intellectual property. It is around this course. I've got scripts, I've got ideas embedded in those. I've got pictures, I've got all this material. Arshad Lelo, just like that. <clears throat> so uh, they, this gift came with two conditions. The first condition was her course must be taught by a local professor. It has to be done indigenously here in Pakistan. And second, even more important, it has to be done in one of our local languages. <clears throat> Uh, we have 70 languages to choose from, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you know, okay, uh, so this is, this is a great breakthrough for us. And we are currently in the process of launching these courses. But I tell you, really, Barbara's gift is, is not for LUMS. It's, it's not for all the other partners who are interested in doing this kind of work. Uh, I think she's making us a national offering for all of us, for all audiences, made in Pakistan for all Pakistanis. And, and so... Um, if you are one of those uh, people who want to join us in this consortium to broaden the, uh, the effectiveness this course has had on millions of young people, then uh, uh, please uh, join us in this adventure. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Barbara Oakley.
Can you hear me now? I'm so happy to be here. I I can't tell you. I I absolutely love Pakistan. You have the most wonderful country. It, it's such an honor to be here, and I very much appreciate Arshad's invitation and Lum's sponsoring of our, our talk today, along with Jazz. So, and of course, the Aga Khan University has been, uh, I, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share that they provided. So, I should begin by giving you a, a sort of a, a feel for what it's like for me to go to my day job. So I work at Oakland University, and if you know a little bit about the United States, Oakland is a city in California. So everybody always thinks, I'm from Oakland, California. And it's all sunny and beautiful, but that's not the Oakland that I live in. <laughs> I actually, uh, Oakland University is in Michigan, and that's me going to my typical, uh, typical day, going to my job uh, in February uh, in Michigan. So as, uh, as Arshad had mentioned, I teach this course, Learning How to Learn, and my co-instructor in this course is Terry Sanowski, the Francis Crick professor at the Salk Institute. And this is Terry going to work at his day job. So that's one of the, the great things about online learning is that not only can students get together from all sorts of different places, but professors can get together with very big different backgrounds as well. So to my shock, I was invited to speak at Harvard. I mean, I was a nervous wreck. It's, it's Harvard. And so, you know, I, I went and prepared as well as I could. And I walked in, and I was even more surprised because the room was packed, standing room only. And I thought, why are there so many people here? It turns out that Terry's in my one little course made for less than $5,000, mostly in my basement, had on the order of the same number of students as all of Harvard's massive open online courses and online courses put together, made for millions of dollars with hundreds of people. And what this tells you, I think, is something very important. And that is, people are starved for good, practically useful, well-grounded in science information about how they can learn effectively. And so um, we often think that, well, uh, if, you're, if you have an online course, it's never going to be as good as face-to-face -face teaching. But I would remind you that in face-to-face -face teaching, you've got this bell curve of effectiveness, and half of all your professors are below average. So with online learning, you can get really good, high-quality material uniformly presented in a very good way, and that's a boon for people themselves. Uh, I'll also mention that online learning, people just say, oh, you know, it's never as good as face-to-face. -face. But here is our older daughter, Rosie, and she illustrates that actually online learning can be really as good or even better than face-to-face. -face. And she illustrates it in an unusual way. So, so you know, you might wonder, how do you... How did you shoot the, the uh, footage so cheaply for this massive open online course? Well, part of the secret is you get your family members to do bit parts whenever you need it. They, they're so cheap. They work for food. So, so, so this is our Rosie. And Rosie, um, at that time, was in her third year of medical school. And she... So she was willing to kind of wear these earphones and block out sound and, and demonstrate that you really need to focus um, and, and get rid of sound if you're going to learn effectively. And she was willing to wear these kind of dorky-looking 
um, earphones. And, uh, and so about four months after the course came out, this, she went to class. And of course, she's sitting there with the other 70 medical school students in her class. And the, the, her professor was this preeminent cardiologist from Southeast Michigan. He's teaching the class, suddenly stops, points right at her and says, you, you're the girl in the MOOC. <laughs> so here's this very prestigious, highly trained professional who actually, he's watching these massive open online courses because he's getting a lot out of it that he can't get in other ways. So, so stepping back just a little bit further, I, I should give you more information about how I grew up and, and why I was even interested in this topic. As it turns out, I, I grew up moving all over the United States. So by the time I hit about 15 years old, I'd lived in, in 10 different places. Now, the thing about moving is that mathematics can be incredibly sequential. So if you fall off anywhere along the way, it can be very difficult to get back on. Well, when I was seven years old and we were moving from Lubbock, Texas to Chelmsford, Massachusetts, suddenly they were way far ahead of me in the multiplication tables. And, well, quite honestly, I, I never really liked math that much anyway. And I just thought, well, I guess I don't, I don't have the knack. I don't have the talent for math. I'm not a math person. So I kind of flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science, which is ironic, seeing as how I'm speaking to you here today, as a professor of engineering. And I'm the real deal. I mean, I publish in top journals. I am a fellow of uh, several uh, very good uh, engineering organizations. One day, one day, one of my students found out about my sordid past, my terrible past as a math flunky. And he asked me, how did you do it? How did you change your brain? And I thought, how did I do it? I mean, here I was. You know, I love this picture of me because it is the last cute picture of me. <laughs> but, but I loved animals, and I liked knitting and weaving and all those kinds of things, and I knew I could never grow up and be anything technical. So I thought, what could I do? Well, it's not like Pakistan. Works. There's so much multilingual knowledge in the U.S., especially at that time, most people just spoke English. And uh, I, I wanted to learn another language. But I couldn't afford to go to college. And so I thought, how can I learn a new language? Well, I realized there was one way I could learn a new language and actually get paid for it. And that was to join the Army. So, so yes, that's me looking super nervous. Uh, I'm about to throw a grenade. And if you knew how clumsy I actually am, you would know why I look so nervous. <laughs> but I did learn a new language. I learned Russian. I ended up working out on Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea. And I just loved seeing the world through new perspectives and having new adventures. So I also ended up at the South Pole Station in Antarctica, and that's where I met my husband. So I always say I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that wonderful man. So, so the, the thing is, um, I had done everything they said to do. I'd followed my passion. I'd learn Russian, which I really want to do, but I'd forgotten one thing. I'd forgotten that by following only my own selfish passion, I, I wasn't actually looking at what the world's needs were. And I hadn't, I'd followed my passion without broadening my passions. And in fact, I put myself in a little box. There were no recruiters coming to my door and saying, we just have to have your Slavic languages and literature skills. So, so it, I, I thought about it. 
And I, I thought, uh, I remembered I worked with all these West Point engineers, and they had these books that looked sort of like this, kind of like a foreign language. And then I, I, I realized, aren't I supposed to be open to new perspectives and new adventures? Why don't I see if maybe I can learn in some of these, in this new area, see if I can retool my brain and learn in math and science. So at age 26, I, I got out of the military and I, I went back to the university and I began with remedial high school algebra. And I started studying to become well, eventually, the professor you see here today. And it was not easy. But if I'd known then what I know now about how to learn effectively, I could have made it so much easier on myself. So back when that student asked me, how did you change your brain? I, I wrote him a little email. And then I thought, you know, I like to write books. So why don't I write a little book about how your brain changes when you're learning? And so I put together the manuscript for this book, and I sent it out to thousands of professors and, and heard back from shocking percentages of them with suggestions for improvement in the manuscript. But one thing that I heard kind of surprised me. It was almost like this kind of shared secret handshake. Of the, the professors would say, oh, here's this point, this point, this point. And by the way, I do this one little extra thing in my teaching, and it's like magic. It works so beautifully, but I usually don't like to say that I do this to other professors because they'll give me a bad time. And that one little thing was the use of metaphor and analogy. And why did they not want to share about these ideas? Because the other professors would, uh, they would say, oh, that's why you're so popular. You're just dumbing down and making everything so easy that that's why you're seen as a good teacher. But that's not true. We now know through neural reuse theory that if you use a metaphor from, based on something you already know, you can more rapidly onboard students to new ideas. So, for example, I was watching outside coming in here. There were these little boys playing in the fountain. They were having a blast, just fun with the water. And, uh, and really, water is kind of hard to figure out. When you're a little kid you know, and you're a baby, you're fascinated by water. And, but, but the thing is, once you get the idea of how water flows, you can use that as an analogy for electrical current flow. Now, we know that negative particles flow this way, and we're modeling it as positive particles going the other way, and of course, at a quantum level, it all breaks down. But the thing about a metaphor is when you have a good metaphor, you use it as long as it works, and when it breaks down, you throw it away, and you just get a new one. So I reached out to top neuroscientists when I was writing this manuscript, top, uh, top cognitive psychologists. Uh, I myself have taught uh, for many years in engineering and published in engineering and engineering education. So what I'm going to present to you this afternoon is some of the best of what I found from the, the great research being done about how we learn effectively. So the brain, as we know, is enormously complicated. But fortunately, we can simplify its operation to two fundamentally different modes. The first one I'll call focus mode. It's just what it sounds like. You're focusing either on the, the board here or on me. And, and, so, and that's what we often think of as the classical way we learn when you're focusing. The other mode, I'll call it diffuse mode. And diffuse mode, you're still thinking, but you're kind of, uh, it's, 
thoughts are going more randomly through your head. So you might be doing something like taking a shower or riding on a bus, falling asleep. You've got thoughts, but you're not focusing them. Now, uh, the focus mode is called by cognitive psychologists the task positive network. And diffuse mode is task negative network. Neuroscientists call that the default mode network. So what we're going to do is uh, to better explain those ideas, I'm going to use a what? metaphor. I, uh, uh, and that's exactly right. The metaphor we're going to use is that of a pinball machine. So if you're of a certain age, like mine, you'll remember how a pinball machine works. But if you don't, uh, I'll give you just a little bit of a, uh, 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 an example. All you do is you pull back on the plunger, and a ball will go bouncing around, and that's how you get points. So it's bouncing on these rubber bumpers. I'm going to put this pinball machine right on the human brain. Are you ready for it? Okay, there we go. There we go. That's the pinball machine on the brain. And notice this is an analogy for the focus mode of thinking. And we've got these rubber bumpers very close together. And that's modeling in real life. It's like a, this tight-knit network that you're using. In focus mode, you often have these patterns that have been laid by virtue of the fact that you've already learned something. So let's say you know how to speak English, even though your mother tongue may be Urdu. So, so you access those, new, those patterns you've learned, and a thought goes bouncing along right along those pathways that you've, uh, that you've already laid. So multiplying 22 times 75, the, it goes right along the pathways, whether you write it down on a piece of paper or you're thinking and you can do it in your head. But what if you, let's say you know multiplication, you're a little kid, but you've never encountered division before. So your teacher comes up to you and explains these ideas. You get them, of course. You think you get them. So what happens, though, is you are going, when you learn division, you're going to lay these new patterns, or you're learning a new language, you're going to lay these new patterns. You're learning a new concept, you're going to lay those new patterns. How do you put them there? I mean, how do we learn something new? As it turns out, what often happens when you're learning something new is you start working on it, and you will inadvertently fall back on patterns that, are, that you're more familiar with. So you're doing division. Oh, you know, oh, you're trying to do integration. No, you're falling back on, on patterns that just don't work. And in fact, you can get really frustrated. I mean, have you ever had that experience? You're trying to figure something new out. You get more and more and more frustrated. You finally shut the book. You walk away. And when you walk away, it begins to open up a completely different set of circuits. And this is the diffuse mode. And this is really what happens. You go from careful, focused activation of a small area to you, you have this broad ranging network where your thoughts are ranging very widely before they hit one of those rubber bumpers. And, and, but so what's happening in the diffuse mode is that you're actually beginning to make sense of the ideas. You can't think in that careful, focused fashion the way you can in the focus mode, but you can at least get to the new perspective you want to be in in order to be able to solve a problem or understand a new concept. So when you're learning, we've always made the mistake we think that you're only learning when you're focusing, but you're actually also learning when you're in diffuse mode. You're consolidating that information. In fact, this is the time 
when new neural connections are really beginning to, uh, to take place. And we'll see that a little bit later. Now, when you're learning something, you, you often are going back and forth between focus mode and diffuse mode. You can't be in both modes at the same time unless you are taking certain forms of mushrooms, and I am not advocating that here. So what I would like you to do now is I would like you to team up. So just turn to someone beside you, and I'd like you to explain what is the difference between focused and diffuse modes. So you get two minutes on your mark, get set, two minutes, go. If you can hear me, raise your hand. Oh, works like a charm, doesn't it? Uh, uh, did you notice something? When you stopped and you turned to your neighbors, you momentarily went into the diffuse mode. It, it, I mean, could you almost feel it was like, oh, okay, yeah. And so... This is why, indeed, it can be kind of a, a very good teaching technique. After a while, direct instruction like I'm doing here is really important and can be very helpful. But if you allow students to take that little break, just for a little bit, it can help them to consolidate and make sense of the information. But you're probably thinking, we got another one of these professors here, these academics that are always so theoretical. I don't have time to go back and forth between focused and diffuse modes. I've got lots of stuff to teach or lots of stuff to learn. And, and more than that, uh, my students or I like to procrastinate. So uh, I don't know, do students in, in, in Pakistan procrastinate? <laughs> uh, I can tell you for sure that procrastination is students' number one issue worldwide. So let's, let's take just a minute or two to speak about procrastination. It turns out that when you even just think of something you don't like or don't want to do, it activates a portion of the brain that experiences pain. So the brain, naturally enough, looks for ways to stop that negative stimulation. So here's what it does. You think about something you don't like. You, uh, it activates a little kind of icky feeling. So you funnel your attention into anything else, and the result, you feel happier almost instantly. You do this once, do it twice, no big deal. You do it very often. And it can have severe long-term consequences in your life or your students' life, lives. They can even think that they can't, they just can't do this topic. When the reality is all they were doing was waiting till the last minute, and that's so stressful to come, to try to study under those circumstances that few people can be successful. So let's I'm an engineer now, let's just cut to the chase. What's the most effective way of dealing with procrastination? It is the Pomodoro technique. 
How many here have heard of uh, or used the Pomodoro technique? Okay, some of you. For the rest of you, you're going to love this, what you're hearing here. Uh, uh, it's so helpful. This technique is very simple. It was developed by a, a, an Italian, Francesco Cirillo, in the, er, in the 1980s. And, and all you have to do to do a Pomodoro is, first off, you get rid of all distractions. So no little ringy dingies on your cell phone, no text messages, nothing popping up on your computer. Try to turn off your little brother. Um, do, do whatever you can to try to minimize distractions. And then you set a timer. Any timer will do for 25 minutes. And then, so uh, I have a, a timer on my laptop. Some people use a timer on their, uh, on their cell phone. There's some wonderful Pomodoro apps out there. Uh, one that people really like is called Forest. Uh, but then you just focus as intently as you can for 25 minutes. Now here's what I'll do. Yes, I do procrastinate. <laughs> and I will catch myself procrastinating. I, I've got some, uh, let's say, uh, I'm working on a research paper. There's this section I have to write. I don't want to. So I set the timer, and I begin working on the, uh, on the Pomodoro. And I work so hard. You would be so proud of me. Sweat's pouring off my brow. You know, and I can't help it. I, I, I look up after a while because I know I'm almost done. And I've just done two minutes of the Pomodoro. And my brain screams, I cannot do another 23 minutes. But I just do the Zen thing. I let that thought go right on by and I return my focus to what I'm working on. Because anyone can do 25 minutes. Although if it's a younger audience or a younger person, you might take their age plus one, and that's a good length for the Pomodoro. So, so then comes the most important part of the Pomodoro technique. That is the reward. So reward means do whatever you want. Uh, you try not to do something that's the same intellectual kind of task. So if you are uh, focusing on writing a report, do not go on to Facebook and write something there. Um, try to do something that's really using different parts of the brain. The best thing of all, do something physical, um, or you know, just uh, you can even play a video game if you want to. Uh, whatever, uh, whatever floats your boat and gets your attention off it. Why? Because you're going from focused during the rewards uh, period to to that diffuse mode, the relaxed mode. So what the Pomodoro is cleverly doing is it's teaching you to concentrate intently on something to really work effectively. And it's also teaching you that you need to relax mentally and take that break. And it's allowing you to get the diffuse mode in you. Now for me, if I'm really on a roll, on a task I'm working on, then I might go for an hour or two hours or something like that. But when you're learning, it can be very effective to take that little break, that little you know, five minute break. Some people do a 25 minute, then a five or 10 minute break, 25 minutes of Pomodoro, another break and so forth. If you have problems bringing yourself back, then just set a timer for the break as well as for the Pomodoro. So learning effectively is a lot like baking a cake. It has lots of different ingredients. And so let's step down at a very deep level and look at one of the most important building blocks of learning, and that is the neuron. There's about 100 billion of them in your brain. Oh, I just, I, I, I should take my camera and take a picture of you guys now. Because you can, you, your faces suddenly kind of go, oh no. <laughs> now she's going to go into the super boring scientific stuff. 
So let's spice it up a little bit. Uh, uh, this, is, this is our metaphor for a neuron. It is a space alien. So notice our space alien has legs, and those legs are dendrites. And then our space alien also has these little toes, lots of little toes, because it's a space alien. And those are analogous to, our, to dendritic, dendritic spines on real neurons. And then uh, a neuron also has an arm that reaches out, and that's called an axon. So what neurons do, this is their, their key purpose in life, is to reach out with their arm and tickle the toe of a, an adjoining neuron. That's what they do. So what, let's watch. Here we go, we've got our neurons, and one of them reaches out and tickles the toe of the next neuron. What this is really doing is it's passing a signal along, and that signal is going to jump this gap here called the synapse and go on. So notice it's going through that dendritic spine onto the next neuron. Now, for those of you who teach uh, neural anatomy or biochemistry, I acknowledge that it is more complicated than that. We've got an electrical signal, and then it comes down, and we've got uh, neurotransmitters jumping across to an electrical signal, but we can just think of it as a signal, and that's good enough. So when you are learning something, you are creating uh, a set of links between neurons. So, so here we go, we've got, let's say you just learned a chord on the guitar, or you learned how to take a derivative in math or you learned uh, how to, to make a movement um, as you're dancing, or whatever you're doing, you, you are creating these, this set of links between some neurons. And in this case, I've just sort of hypothetically said we, we're connecting five neurons when you learn something, but it can be many neurons that connect together. And the more you, you practice with what you're learning, the, the stronger and richer those connections become. So in practice makes better connections. Now, the, these connections, they're almost like sets of links. And the more you practice with an idea, the stronger and richer those sets of links become. When you're learning, oh, I should point out, Remember earlier I talked about neural reuse theory as being why metaphors are important? Metaphors are important because they take an idea you already know, so you know how water flows, and you use that to more efficiently build an understanding of your new concept, electrical current flow. Metaphors are great for doing that because they take sets of links you've already developed and allow you to much more quickly build new sets of links. So as you're learning, you may, well, let, okay, here's what happens in my classes. So I like to think I'm a good teacher. Sometimes I'm a little surprised uh, because uh, they don't learn what I think they've learned. But often I'll explain something and I'll explain it pretty clearly I ask questions, the students get it in class, and they, they really get it. They take the notes, and then they go home, and they, they work other jobs, and they, they have other classes, and they don't happen to look at their notes for two weeks. And then what happens is they, oh, I'm gonna give them a test. So they take out their notes, and what they understood when I explained it suddenly doesn't make sense at all. They, 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 they had that concept. Where did the concept go? Here's what happened. Because they didn't use those sets of links for two weeks, their little sort of synaptic janitor just went, oh, these dendritic spines are not being used. Well, let's get rid of them. And, and off they go. And so you actually physically don't have that infrastructure that you were starting to build. 
Now, when you're learning something, so like right now, you're learning something, dendritic spines are beginning to poke out. But when they really come out and strengthen is at night when you go to sleep. So you can kind of see here, they're poking out, and then at night, it makes that practice and builds that, that set of connections. So sleep is a really important part of learning. And in fact, they've shown if you, let's say that you, you learn something and then you only get three hours of sleep that night. There's occasional people who can handle that, but most people, what will happen in the morning, they actually do not consolidate. They, they can't remember what they learned because they didn't have the sleep to help strengthen those connections. So this is why it's, well, I, I can actually show you this. If you look at, this is a, a fantastic technique called light microscopy. It images living neurons. So here we have a dendrite with dendritic spines before learning and before sleep. And here we have uh, dendrites after, look, this is this den, uh, dendrite after learning and after sleep. And look right here. Look at this blue triangle. There is no dendrite or dendritic spine there before learning and before sleep, but there's one that grew after learning and after sleep. That's when those new dendritic spines really pop out. So it's so important to sleep in the night to consolidate the information you've learned during the day. What, what's happening is, let's say you have five hours to learn some material. So what you want to do is you want to space out your learning. So one hour, let's say, each day over five days, what that's going to do is that's going to double your learning because you're not only learning during this hour, but at night, you are strengthening those connections. So learn, strengthen, learn, strengthen, learn, strengthen. So you, at the end, you have a really solid neural architecture. If you cram five hours in one day, look, it's, it's, you've got only one evening of sleep, if that, and your little synaptic janitor can much more easily sweep those patterns away. So this is why it's so important uh, not to cram. And in fact, one of the problems frequently experienced by very intelligent students is they get by on cramming. Works great, works great, works great. Go to the university, take some tough courses, and suddenly in the middle of the semester, they're beginning to flounder because it, they're cramming and they're not building that good neural architecture and then it turns out to be, uh, a, a, it kind of fades away, and they're not, they, they can't understand the material. So another analogy we can use is we can say it's kind of like building a brick wall. You, you lay the layer of bricks, lay the mortar, lay more bricks, gradually building the structure and letting the mortar dry. If you don't do that, if you do it all at once, your structure of learning looks kind of like this, and it's a very poor foundation for learning. Another, since I love metaphors, another metaphor that I think is useful is to think about a weightlifter. So let's say that you got, you got this guy, and here you are, this kind of skinny, you know, 150-pound weakling or something, and you're going to compete against this person. Do you think your best strategy is to cram the night before by lifting a lot of weights. <laughs> I mean, it's clear when you're building muscular structure that you have to do it over a period of time. It's quite, quite similar for building neural architecture. But because we can't see into the brain, people tend to go, oh, well, I can just cram. It's all mush up there. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. But it's not. It's much like this. It takes time to build good neural architecture. And again, this is why procrastination can be such an issue, because you want to do a little every day and not cram until the end. But this fellow is, he has another advantage. 
And that is that he's exercising. And exercise, as researchers have found over the decades, is one of the most profound ways to improve your ability to learn and remember. Whatever kind of native neural apparatus you've got, you can improve it by, by just exercising. And we've researchers have thought, well, why is that? And they, they haven't known until very recently what goes on when you're exercising. It turns out when you exercise, you produce in the brain a substance called brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's abbreviated as BDNF. And BDNF is kind of like a fertilizer for the brain. So I can show you that. If you look here, we've got, here's a, a, a dendrite. And this is before researchers essentially sprinkled BDNF on this, this dendritic or dendrite. And I'm going to show you what happens after they sprinkle this BDNF on it. Watch this. This is the same neuron after application of BDNF. Look at all these dendritic spines. They're just kind of go, wow, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I want to learn something. Hook me into something. They're already pre-grown and ready. So it helps a lot with learning if you're able to effectively or to have some sort of exercise. What kind of exercise? Uh, what I generally find in research is that um, whatever exercise that researcher prefers, that's usually the one they say is a really good one to do. But uh, so uh, mostly any kind of exercise is going to be efficient. So, so now I get this is we're going to go to the, probably from my perspective, the most important part of this talk. And that relates to working memory and long-term memory. And working memory is what you can hold briefly in your mind. So let's say I, I gave you one, two, four, seven, two, five, that number, and I said remember it. You would remember it by repeating it in your mind. And you're holding it in working memory by this repetition. Long-term memory, it's like, what's your address? What's your friend's names? What is something you maybe have learned in school? <laughs> so that's stored in long-term memory. And working memory is in the prefrontal cortex, sort of towards the front of your brain. And it can hold, on average, four pieces of information at a time, a maximum of about that. And so let's imagine it as being like this attentional octopus that's parked in the front of your brain. So here we go. We've got our attentional octopus. It's got four arms, can hold four items. What is long-term memory? It's this kind of, it's, it's everywhere in the brain, but I'm going to model it. Oh, this is going in and out, isn't it? Uh, I'm going to model it as something, let's see, are, is this sounding okay to you guys? Because it kind of goes in and out to me. Uh, uh, it's okay? Okay. So, so this, uh, th this long-term memory is, I'm going to model it as a set of lockers, and these lockers have stored inside of them sets of links that you've created because you've learned something. So, so when you are learning something, your working memory is working really, really hard to try to understand the material. So, but once you understand and you've practiced with that material, you've created essentially a set of links. And then uh, it's almost like this computer subroutine that whenever you need it, your working memory can just reach out and grab that set of links, and that those sets of links do the neural processing for you because you've already learned how to do something. So I'll give you an example of that. And, and this relates to our younger daughter, Rachel. So we're sitting around the dinner table one evening, and I asked the girls, I said, I need someone to model backing up a car really badly. 
Uh, my daughter Rachel's like, Mom, I got that. I can do that. So this is Rachel backing up a car. And she, she actually had learned not that long before how to back up a car. So she's modeling what it was like for her as she was backing up the car. And watch her little face here. It's like, oh, do I look in the front mirror? No, the back mirror. Oh, no, wait. Oh, wait. Do I go forward? No, back. No. Uh, and then off she goes into the ditch. So when you are learning anything, whether it's backing up a car, a procedure in mathematics, some new language concept, something in philosophy, you are, in essence, learning something really tough, and your mind has to put together those ideas. You have a heavy cognitive load. You, you don't have any arms left on your attentional octopus to hold anything else. But once you've learned those ideas, right, she's learned how to back up a car, all she has to do is think, I want to back up the car, and she pulls that set of limbs to mind, and she's got other arms of her attentional octopus free. She has a light cognitive load. She can think about, do I need to buckle my seatbelt, or what's the song on the radio? Working memory, she's got other arms available for more complex thinking. So when you learn something well, you practice with it. So this is what you want your students to do. You want, you want to have some creative element in a good test. But you also want to test, do they know the basic fundamentals? If they prepare well, they will know those basic fundamentals. Then their working memory comes up and says, oh, yeah, you know, oh, I know that idea. Oh, my professor wants me to connect it with this other idea and maybe even this third idea. So the creativity is much easier to do because you practice with the materials. Students will sometimes come up to me and say, you know, I didn't test well because I suffer from test anxiety. That's true, some students really do suffer from test anxiety, but generally what I find is students who think they suffer from test anxiety I'm told by their, their uh, teammates, they don't practice, they don't do homework with their teams, they, they haven't actually studied the material. So they sit down to try to do a test, and it's the first, their working memory is going crazy trying to figure it out. They think it's test anxiety, but it's actually, they're just trying to learn the material. So because we haven't taught students what it means to learn effectively, it, they, they can kind of come to these very erroneous uh, ideas about what it takes to learn well. Experts of all types, are the, their common factor is they have lots and lots of sets of links. So, 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 so I want to switch gears a little bit, and I want to give you just a little bit of background that's relevant for understanding some of the deepest levels of how we learn. So, so I'm going to talk about, remember I've talked about how sets of links, you create sets of links in long-term memory? Well, the way you do that is you're actually, your working memory creates those sets of links and they go via the hippocampus into long-term memory. And they go via something called the trisynaptic pathway. So you learn a fact, and it goes right there through the hippocampus, the trisynaptic pathway, into long-term memory. Another fact, same thing, through trisynaptic pathway. But all these facts that you're learning also funnel, at the same time, they're being processed through something called the monosynaptic pathway. And this monosynaptic pathway is what helps you recognize patterns. So if, if you think that you can always look it up, and that's why you can learn something, that's just not true. You have to have some facts embedded in your brain in order for your brain to create patterns. If you want to have number sets, 
You need to have some basic facts embedded in your brain. Would I know how to speak Urdu if I just looked it up on Google Translate? I mean, you have to have some basic facts as you're learning anything. It's an important thing. Now, I, I do uh, say, uh, remember what happens when a lecture goes too long. <laughs> Sorry about it. I have so much information I just want to share here. But what, what, is, what is happening when a lecture goes too long, you're getting all this information. It's going into your hippocampus, but you're exceptional here. So I know your hippocampal buffers are really big in Pakistan. Uh, but it goes in there, and when you're able to take a little tiny break, it, it, it offloads that information from the hippocampus into long-term memory. So those little breaks are really valuable because it helps clear your buffers. Uh, mentally, and then you can be fresher when you're coming back. So there's always, always this trade-off. Direct instruction is a powerful teaching tool, um, uh, but you know, little breaks are also valuable. So uh, research, in fact, report uh, supports short breaks. So when you're studying, short little breaks are very helpful. And um, oh, that's funny. So um, so anyway, take a little break. There, there we see our octopus kind of having a little fun uh, taking a break there. So, so I have to digress momentarily into STEM instruction, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, because uh, it's near and dear to my heart, and I think it's really important for the future of Pakistan to remain competitive or to be super competitive in, in the world today where analytical skills are also important as well as other kinds of skills. So in the US, there's this feeling, oh, you know, we need more people who have a STEM background, analytical skills, but we're not getting enough, so let's make STEM more fun. We're going to throw eggs off buildings. We're going to just do everything we can to make it more fun. And what happens then is something I call the math and science death march. Because everything is fun, fun, fun until you go to the university and you take your first calculus course, and then it's not fun anymore. And then people just change their majors. So, uh, so to, to give a little background into why this can be happening, there's two different basic types of knowledge, and this grows from evolutionary theory. There's what I'll call the easy stuff. Babies come out, and within days, they can recognize faces. This is a really hard thing to do. I mean, if universities had their way, they'd be like, the only way you can recognize faces if you take a graduate level course on facial recognition. But infants can do it in, in a matter of a couple of days. So, uh, so this is easy stuff because we've evolved to recognize faces. There's also learning, to, uh, learning your first language. Babies have evolved to do that. Put babies around a bunch of people, listen to them talk, babies will pick it right up. It's just something that we do. Okay, but then there's the harder stuff. And, and uh, this hard stuff are things like reading and writing. Okay, let's take that same baby and put it around a, a stack of books. Is the baby going to pick up how to read? You need instruction in order to be able to help kids repurpose their neural circuits because they have not evolved to learn how to read. Math is the same thing. They have to repurpose circuits, and, uh, and it's harder to learn. So when teachers say, you know, we just got to make all education just as fun as when, when they're babies, that learning should always have that ease as when people were really young. The, the problem is you're learning harder stuff. Your brain isn't evolved for that. So it's natural that sometimes it can be more difficult 
And that should be expected. And if you try to make it super easy, you're actually doing a disservice for students. Do you want to make it inspirational? And, you know, as, as good and kind of fun as you can, yes. But don't go overboard with, we just have to make it like when they were learning, when they were young. So, um, so uh, let me ask you a question. So we took that diffuse mode break, uh, and, and it was kind of an active learning break, and it was really helpful. So does that mean that everything we do as instructors should it always be these active breaks? Should we have student-centered learning so it's always students interacting with one another and then I'm not doing any instruction at all? I think that's an important question to, to just spend a moment exploring. And a person who can help guide us is, um, well, an idea that can help guide us is that of effect size. So who near here knows what effect size is? Don't worry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through it like in, in one minute. So uh, it's a little different than that. So, um, so let's imagine, how many here like to listen to music when they study or learn something? How many don't like to listen to music? I'm in that camp, okay. So you might wonder, what does research tell you about which one you should do? Actually, whatever you want research to find, you can find research that will back you up. <laughs> so so the, the thing is, so let's take that. Let's say that you have students listening to music, and, uh, and here's their average, uh, or the, you know, sort of the grade distribution if they listen to music. And then we can say, if they didn't listen to music, this is their average grades. You can see my preference. This is actually all hypothetical here. The difference between those two means is called the effect size. So it's a way of telling whether any intervention you do is actually effective. So a fellow by the name of John Hattie did uh, a big study, and it's published in a book called Visible Learning, and he studied a lot of different factors that influence how, how students learn. And he found that on average, uh, most interventions have an ultimate average effect size of about 0.4. This is normalized, so that's why it doesn't have a point for something, right? So, so if you have something that is higher effect size than point four, it's pretty good. If it's lower than point four, it, it, you may want to question whether it's as good, um, even though sometimes it can still be good. But don't look at all the individual things. This is just meant to give you a sense of different factors, and the effect size of these many different factors, here's the average effect size of 0.4. The very biggest factor is that of teacher efficacy. The teacher efficacy is 1.57. It is the most important factor that researchers have found about whether students can learn effectively. But there's other factors that are also very good. So uh, look at this, video review of lessons. Ha ha ha, that's got an effect size of 0.88. So that's a really helpful thing to do. Mnemonics, that means little memory tricks, effect size of 0.76. Direct instruction, like I'm doing right here, 0.6. So I would like to add a little more breaks, but I want you to get done in a good time, so. But directed instruction is actually a very powerful technique. Cooperative learning, effect size of 0.4. So uh, that, you know, I think cooperative learning is very valuable, but you need to add that in with direct instruction. Uh, so I'm just giving you some examples here, and this gives you a sense of how to begin thinking about how to rank 
different interventions. And this is helpful because uh, there, there are so many fads in education. Um, we often kind of think of you know, um, you know something that's really going to help, and uh, and people will even cite papers and say this is validated by research, but it's actually still a fad. So there's there's in fact a replicability crisis. Uh, I was at National Institutes of Health Health recently. So many publications are are they're published in top journals. Other people go to try to repeat them. They can't because there's so much bias, small uh, small numbers uh, in the study. There's all sorts of problems. And in educational literature, this is actually kind of uh, redoubled. There's not very much replication at all in, in educational research. So you just want to be a little careful here. I want to bring up the idea of what am I doing here right now? I'm doing direct instruction. So this is high direct instruction. And uh, low direct instruction would be something more student-centered. So you allow the students to construct their knowledge. Low versus high direct instruction. Let's contrast that with the easy stuff and the hard stuff in, uh, in what students are trying to learn. As it turns out, the harder from an evolutionary perspective, the material being learned, the more it looks like direct instruction is really helpful. Now, there are other factors, just like those little breaks. So time is also a factor. And we haven't studied this very much. Working memory capacity is also a very important thing. So, so I just want to bring out these ideas so you get a little sense of what, uh, of the kinds of considerations you want to be thinking of as you're teaching. So, or learning anything for that matter. But I'd like to bring it back as we're closing to talk about aspects of ourselves and our students that we often think are terrible, terrible facets of their personalities or our personalities. And one of the things I mean by this is let's, let's take, for example, poor memory. Many people think having a poor memory is a very bad thing. But I am here to tell you that having a poor memory is actually a good thing. <laughs> so why is that? Remember when I talked about working memory and we've got those four informational arms, we can hold four things, you know, some people, some people actually have like six or eight arms on their attentional octopus. They can hold this stuff really solidly in mind. Other people, you know, they've got those four arms of working memory, but oh, shiny, you know, I just got distracted <laughs> and something falls out. But when something falls out, something else comes in, and these individuals are often more creative, very creative. What, do you have to work harder to keep up with the sort of intellectual Jones that have a very sticky working memory? Yes, you do, but you would almost certainly not want to trade the creativity that that poor working memory can give you. Now then there's the other sort of terrible thing people um, think of in, with regards to learning is slow learners. So some people, well, for example, in my class, I may be teaching uh, statistics and probability. I ask a really complicated question. And as soon as the question comes out of my mouth, someone sitting in the first row, hand in the air, got the answer. And you can almost see the rest of the class going, but what's in it for me? I I'm never going to be as fast a learner as that. And it is true. Some people are, they're, they've got like race car brains. They can get to the finish line really fast. Other people have more like hiker brains. They get to the finish line, but it's a lot slower. 
But think about the differences between what those two kinds of brains experience. Race car, everything goes by in a blur. For the hiker, they can reach out, touch the leaves, hear the birds, you can see the little rabbit trails, completely different experience, and in some ways, far richer and deeper. Now, my hero in science is a man named Santiago Ramoni Cajal, and Cajal was a terrible learner. He really, really struggled to get information from working memory into long-term memory to try and hold information in working memory. Uh, he was a real problem in schools. He was kicked out of several schools, and he eventually won the Nobel Prize and is now considered the father of modern neuroscience. And Cajal was asked, what did you do that was so different? And he said it was two factors. One was he was persistent. So even though it was hard for him, he worked to build those sets of links, and he was able to do that. The second thing he said, though, was he said, I was flexible. He said, I was no genius, and he was not. But he said, I have worked with many geniuses. And what can happen with geniuses is they're super smart. So they grow up being really fast with the answers. And as adults, they can tend to jump to conclusions. And then when they're wrong, they haven't had experiences correcting their mistakes. So what happens? They, they inflexibly retain their ideas and just use their intellects to justify why they must have been right after all. So if you, uh, like Ramoni Cajal, or your students, are slow learners, rejoice, because you can sometimes see things that even geniuses cannot. So thank you so very much for your attention. And yeah, uh, Pakistan Zindabad. Can you hear me? Thank you so much, Dr. Oakley. And the good news is we're actually going to open the floor for questions for Dr. Oakley now. So I'd just like to invite the Associate Dean of the LAM, Sayyid Ehsan Ali and Sayyid Maratab Ali School of Education, Dr. Maryam Chukhtai. Please help me welcome her. Thank you so much. Uh, I've listened to this talk more than once, but every time I learn something new, so I really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to take questions. There are three rules for questions. You have to say your name. The question has to end with a question mark, and it has to be short, so one to two sentence. So we'll take a couple of questions, two, two to three questions together, then Dr. Oakley will respond, and then we'll take it from there. So we'll start from this end. My name is Anita Shalakari, and I work with Pakistan Petroleum Limited. Uh, my question is, the Pomodoro technique is supposed to work for three hours, as I assume. So is that uh, what we apply to the learning uh, exercise as well? Um, so uh, the Pomodoro technique is supposed to be applied yeah, for... I mean, uh, since... Uh, for three hours? When I was applying this for my daily routine work in the office, I was using this for three hours. I mean. 25 minutes work, then five minutes rest, and then 25 minutes more. And after uh, two and a half hours, you were taking a 30 minutes break. Right. So is that what we do in learning something new as well? Um, the thing is, it is shocking to me, but the Pomodoro technique is marvelously effective. I have heard so much about it. There's very little actual scientific research. There's just a little bit. So I don't think anyone has really found the magic formula. I think that's what's often recommended by uh, Francesco Cedillo and his group, and I think it works very well. But I also think it's modifiable for like younger children and so forth. So I, I think it's a uh, it's that that's a good approach. But it also depends on 
you know, your own circumstances. Uh, oftentimes for me, I just find that just sitting down, setting the timer, I often will wear earphones when I'm going to do at Pomodoro. So I'll put those earphones on. At those earphones that you saw with Rosie, those were actually my earphones. And that somehow I, it signals my brain, oh, start working. And I don't even think about what I'm going to be working on because that could trigger the pain. I just start working on it, and uh, it's just marvelously helpful. Thank you. So we'll take a couple of questions, and I'll ask you to respond to them together or as best as you if can. If you can remind me. I will. I, I, will. Have, I have a uh, terrible I want to just get, uh, so please go ahead. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, we'll just take this person first, and then. Uh, no, no worries. Okay. Yeah, hi, my name is Uzair. I'm the CEO of Native Learning. We're actually making online courses in native languages. Uh, it was interesting to see, I was wondering why, what you think about the interleaving being so low on the effect size, even though that was a big part of your course. Uh, and can you explain why that is? And your thoughts on that? Can I briefly answer this? Just yes. It's a, such a good question. Doug Warwer has just done a gold standard study. So he pre-registered what the results were and found that it was actually highly effective. So I don't think that was included in John Hattie's, um, but I, I too think that interleaving is very, the foundational very part of education, cumulative assessments. So take a look at Doug Rohrer's most recent paper in 2019. Please, Matt. Uh, good evening, doctor. Uh, at first, I would like to say thank you very much that you have won our hearts. You said Pakistan Zindabad, <laughs> and definitely Pakistan Zindabad. Mm -hmm. My name is Munawar Hamid. I am founder of uh, Knowledge Pakistan. Knowledge Pakistan is basically a growing organization. Uh, I mean, I don't want to say in detail, www.knowledgepakistan.com. Basically, uh, my question is this, that in learning how to learn, in this basically there's, there is a methodology in pedagogy in which basically we make a chart in such a way that when we read something, you know when you read something, and second, in the second column, you do not know. And the third, basically, you're asking. So what is your research in this regard? This is the question, please. I, uh, so. Basically, I, when, we, when we discuss about learning, so basically, we can create a sheet. I give you a research paper. When you read the research paper, in the first chunk, in the first part, when you read the research paper, you can jot down the points that after reading that specific research paper, what do you learn? And then when you're reading, in the second column, you can create those questions which you do not learn, I which see. you do not know. And finally, the person who is, who is the instructor, he's supposed to give the answer. So what is your research in this connection? So this I, is the question. Your, your opinion on this method of trying to learn some, some content, if you were to sort it out in uh, these categories. Very briefly, uh, I'm not aware of that specific approach, but I'm aware of a very well-studied phenomenon of on uh, a recall, a technique called recall. This was published in Science by Jeff Karpicki. And uh, what they found is if you, um, if you look at a page, look away and see if you can recall the key idea uh, without looking at the page, then that enhances understanding and helps you remember the idea much better after several weeks than underlining, rereading, or concept mapping. So it's a very effective technique that seems to be related to what you were discussing. So, uh, wow, uh, the lady in the back, yes. Yes, you with the glasses on your head, yes. You can just speak out your question until the microphone gets to you. My name is Samra Zishan, and uh, I'm a teacher at, uh, I'm an elementary teacher. I just want to know, is there any pedagogy regarding your this, uh, training? Like, uh, I'm going to learn uh, how to assess when your, when your student is in a hippocampus state. Is there anything that we can get trained about this? That if, if I'm delivering some lesson, right? And how I'm going to grasp that my student is in a hippocampus state from his working memory, and now he is, you know? Oh, I, I'm, what I'm showing there with the hippocampus yeah. is like the cutting edge of research on what we know about how the brain is 
processing information, as far as applying that in classroom situations, that's probably another decade or more away. So, um, you know, so there's, we don't know yet. Uh, uh, the proof is often in the pudding, though. If your students are successful in the tests you give them, that's about the best way that we can know. One thing I'd like to say, if there's young people in the audience who feel like asking a question. Uh, All right, we'll take a question from, wow. from, please tell us your name also. And in the, oh, in here the we microphone. Go. My name is Isha Zera. And I wanted to ask you a question that you said you didn't like maths and science. Why was that? <laughs> it's a beautiful oh, question. <laughs> See, they, they ask the hardest questions. <laughs> uh, you know, that is a really good question. And I think it was, maybe I didn't have a teacher that, you know, I shouldn't blame it all on teachers, but maybe I didn't have a teacher that connected with me about math. And it just didn't seem like it was something that was real and practically useful. I mean, I, I, I look back on it now and I just think, how silly. I mean, of course I should know how to do my taxes or compute a mortgage on a house and those kinds of things. But at that time, I just wasn't thinking that way. I just thought, I can get away with not knowing math. And I was a little stubborn, and so I... That's kind of why I, I went in that direction. Very good question. I've never been asked that question before, and so wonderful. That's a great question. Okay, yes, the gentleman in the back, yes, in the brown outfit. Yep, yes. Your name? Saqib, who's a trainer, yes. Um, what happens to uh, our mind when you begin to learn something, and as the time goes by, we get this feeling we can't do it and okay. you know as a and and as the time go by, goes by we, we begin to feel that you know we can't do it what kind of shapes does the mind uh, you know what kind of changes does the mind experience when we have this feeling that's another difficult question i think we can look at it a little bit by studying the placebo effect and if you look, when you, let's say that you are taking a drug that you think is going to be really helpful with um, whatever disease you might have. You really think it's going to be helpful. Well, what happens is it's actually really helpful. And you can see the neural circuits, you know, kind of changing. There's subtle changes in imaging. Uh, if you look up, uh, some of the papers of a, a fellow named Tor, uh, T-O-R-R, -R, on placebo effect. It has some fantastic stuff. All we know now is it's extremely complex. All sorts of different things are happening when you think something's going to work. And so it's reasonable to assume it's similar when you think something's not going to work. But part of the reason I taught about focused and diffuse right off the bat is I think that's incredibly important for people to know because you often get this, I think part of it, when I, when I got stuck on math, I would think, you know, I'm just stupid. I don't have the math gene. And so I'm not getting it right away, so I, I might as well just give up on it. And I teach about focus and diffuse because it's a way of signaling it's okay not to figure it out right away. You're not dumb. Uh, you're, you're actually just repurposing evolutionarily secondary circuits, and it takes a little time to do that. You can still learn not only as good, but actually even better than somebody for whom it comes more naturally. So I think just understanding about focused and diffuse and it's okay to back away and tackle it again later that day or the next day it is a powerful way of, of helping with this idea of, no, I can't do it. Just one second. Uh, so we, we are going to have a lot, a lot of the very good questions coming up. <clears throat> we are going to have a panel shortly. We're going to take a few more questions. Just going to go even deeper into the Pakistani context of this. And then we'll have another round of Q&A as well. So it's, it's good. 
Um, so we'll take a question on this end and then we'll come on that end. Um, yes, sir. Please. My name is Dr. Babar. Uh, one question has perplexed me for many years that I understand things from example and non-example, that I understand care from that it is not a table. So what is not learning? For instance, if I, if I am in a situation where I'm not learning mathematics, but I'm still learning that the teacher is very boring or teacher is knowing nothing. So what is through which you can explain what is not learning so that I can understand what is learning more deeply? <clears throat> it's a bit of a philosophical question. Um, you know, there's just so many ways to not learn something that I can't really quantify that. It's like there's, there's end to the end factorial of ways not to learn something. Now, there are a variety of ways to actually learn something, but it's a, a more limited set. So I, I think that's such a deeply philosophical question that I will have to go home tonight and think on it to give a sophisticated And you'll have answer. to come back to Pakistan and tell us what you found out. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> okay, a final question on that end. Uh, yes, sir? Please share your name and affiliation too. This is Mohammed uh, representing uh, uh, an international television. Uh, universities all around the world uh, are opening up uh, uh, their campuses, particularly online. Uh, in that regard, uh, particularly in the domain of direct instructions, as you uh, just pointed out, uh, you, you showed us a graph uh, that for the hard, uh, hardcore sciences, for example, electrical engineering uh, and how hardcore mathematical uh, domains, uh, and these philosophy. That's these, like yeah, of course. Than that. These yeah. direct instructions are important, right? So, uh, in contrary to this, when I see MIT opening up very hard courses, for example, on deep learning, on machine learning, on artificial intelligence, uh, why do you think these big institutions are opening up very hardcore mathematical and uh, some sometimes pure uh, laboratory sciences? opening up for, for the people in the indirect instructions domain. But those courses are often in the direct instruction domain as well. There, there's a big part of what, what I understood is, uh, do you mean direct instruction domain, the one, as, as you pointed out, the one in which we are right now? It is the direct instructions domain. But, but if we are in the virtual domain, if you are in the virtual domain, is that also included into the direct instruction? Because that is a bit confusing for me. If oh, I'm sorry. I, I should have made that more clear. If I am teaching you standing here, you know, face to face, or if I was teaching you explaining in a very similar way on video, both are direct instruction. And I have to add, so my favorite athlete of all times is, is Julius Yeager. He was, a, he was from Kenya. He, uh, if you know anything about Kenya, it was famous for its long distance runners. And Julius didn't want to be a long distance runner. He wanted to throw the javelin. But there were no coaches at all uh, in throwing the javelin in all of Kenya. So he went to YouTube. And he would watch direct instruction on the videos, go out and practice, so active learning, watch the, watch the videos, go practice. Do you know that 99.9, .9, everything he learned, he won the world champion in, in javelin throwing. That was through simple direct instruction on videos and then going out and practicing on his own. So the direct instruction in that way is a very powerful technique. Thank you for allowing me to clarify. Um. So what, <laughs> do you want to ask more questions or should we skip the panel? Yes, what's, okay, let, but let's just take questions then. Yeah, is that fine with our? The panel is really good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, way to put me on the spot, Vice Chancellor. <laughs> like, Mary, you're gone. Um, Thank you.
Quick question is, what is the role of IQ and EQ of that person who is like roaming around the world in learning? Because I found that like I study two hours and tend to do better, but when I study more, I fail. So I always enjoy life. I used I to love to go to Central Park, study two hours, get A minus or A. On the other hand, people, so what do you see IQ and EQ play a role in the person's achievements? Okay, so what's the role of IQ and EQ in, a, in being a successful learner? This is why I, saw, I wrap up my talks by talking about slow learning. Slow learners uh, are often equated with lower IQ. It actually does relate to working memory. So a higher working memory capacity is related to your IQ. Lower working memory capacity lower IQ, but guess what? Lower working memory, you are creative. So uh, what do I have? I, why did I not want to have uh, a collection of questions that I have to answer? I have a terrible working memory. I can't remember this stuff. So uh, I, I know so many brilliant, brilliant scientists and they could never make these kinds of explanations. So I think there's, there, uh, we, we so, uh, I know so many super intelligent people and they jump to conclusions and then they can't change their mind. Give me someone who's a plumber, who's a taxi driver, who's really, I mean, th these are smart people that are often not given the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, credibility that they should be receiving. Well, I think the, so talking about taxi drivers, so I have to say, in the US, there are a fair number of taxi drivers from Pakistan because they, they're well trained, but they come to the US, they don't have the credentials. But here's the thing, so you, you get an American taxi driver, get in the, 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 the car, talk about massive open online courses, you're like, what's that? Never heard of it. Get in with a, a, a taxi driver from Pakistan, they're like, oh yeah, MOOCs, man, I want, have you seen Andrew Ng's course? I mean, it's really good on machine learning. I mean, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I think the high amount of energy in the audience, I would, I think we should continue with question and answer with you. Is that, is that all right? Because I, I think it's a good problem to have. Uh, so, yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, the lady in the front. I'm a medical doctor, Dr. Ira Moniz, and I'm from National University of Medical Sciences. And I've been career counseling people and things like that. When do you say that we have certain likings and then we are procrastinating and, you know, whiling away from the career that, you know, you ended up in a career that was not your first choice when you were when you were little. So we have so many children entering into medical school perforce or something like engineering schools perforce being, you know, Asian parents. I have two who are on the way. I was just trying to ask you this question. How can we guide them into finding what could be best for them? You know, digging out the potential. Is there any tool, something that could, you know, help them find out? I have a child who is applying in medical school. We had a similar question so yesterday many. in Lahore also around yeah. if there was a way to uh, sort of track students into different career paths. Clear out their mind and let them find their best way. Well, let me, uh, th that's a complicated question and I'm going to answer it in a, a, a kind of a, the way that worked for me. How could I help prepare my daughters for being successful in their career paths? I, I, I have a lot of respect for tiger moms who, you know, they, they have their child in dance and in music and they're, they're learning a sport and they're doing, you know, and I, I have so much respect, I can't be that mom. I, I, I'm like a little bit too laid back. So I was like a one subject tiger mom. I figured I could get one little thing that I could encourage my daughters, to, no, I could force my daughters to do whether they liked it or not. 
And so that one thing that I did was I put my girls into a program called Kuman Mathematics, K-U-M-O-N, a new Spanish version that's online of this kind of mathematics is called Smartic, S-M-A-R-T-I-C-K. And uh, so for 20 minutes a day, I had our girls doing some extra practice in math. I didn't tell them what they needed to be in their careers. I just gave them a good foundation in math, better than that which they were getting in the US school system. And our, our older daughter was terrible at math. She would be one of those girls who would be, you know, I just, I can't do math. Because it was really hard for her. She struggled with it. I remember, you know, this is Mr. Bunny. Mr. Bunny has two ears. And, you know, so then when she was in college, she was asking me for a little help with statistics. And I was like, this is Mr. Bunny. It's got two ears. And she was about to kill me. But, uh, but the thing is, th so of our two daughters, our older one struggled with math. Younger one, it came easy. They, they did very well. Younger one became an artist, so that's the one that was good at math. But she's very proud. She, she took calculus in college, got a four point, which was better than her older sister. But her older sister, the one that's really bad at math, just finished her medical residency at Stanford. So that little bit of extra math just opened you know, possibilities for them so that when they could choose, when they chose, they could choose whatever they wanted to, but they had, if you don't get the math, see, this is such a good question. When little, little boys and little girls are growing up, so they're really young, so let's look, so this is a little boy, this is a little girl, and let's look at their difference on average in math and science, so their math abilities. So here they're growing up. Little boy, little girl, let's look at, are they different? Are they different? No, they're not. <laughs> Actually, on average, little boys and little girls have the same math abilities. But here's the difference. When it comes to verbal abilities, here's what's going on. Little girls, a little more advanced verbally than little boys. So same math abilities on average. But little girls have higher, some a little higher on average verbal, and little boys a little lower on verbal. So that means that little boys sit there and go, they're looking inside themselves and they say, well, here's their math, here's their verbal, I'm better at math. Little girls go, you know, uh, here's my math, here's my verbal, I'm better at verbal. Even though they're better, same at math as little boys, but they're looking within themselves, and then we tell little girls, follow your passion. What are they going to do? They're going to go after that verbal stuff because they think that's what they're really good at, and they are kind of good at it. So by giving our daughters some extra practice in math, we were able to level those things out so they didn't just go, oh, I'm just good at verbal, I should follow that. They, they felt that both uh, career options were open with them. So what did my girls do today? So I had the one thing. You know, I didn't force them. I, I introduced them to sports. I introduced them to soccer, uh, yeah, you know, and uh, playing an instrument, all this kind of stuff. Didn't make them do anything but math. So today, they're like, yeah, mom, how come you didn't make us learn a musical instrument? Uh -huh. yeah, you, yeah, so uh, you can't win for losing. But uh, yeah, that's my long-winded answer to that excellent question. So I'm getting all kinds of feedback. I'm going to use my moderator's prerogative and just make the decision. And that is that we're going to have Dr. Oakley join us in the panel. And that, that way we'll have the panel. I want to be respectful of the faculty, guests, and yes. of course, the CEO of Jazz who's with us. And it's really a good panel. Uh, so <laughs> you're going to love it. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have that. Too. Right. Um, so first off, we have the Vice Provost of Asia, Central Asia and UK, and also the Interim Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Aga Khan University, Professor Anjum Halai. I'd now like to invite the Vice Provost of Quality Teaching and Learning at Aga Khan University, 
Dr. Tashmin Khamis. We have with us the Chief Corporate and Enterprise Affairs Officer at Jazz, Mr. Ali Nasir. And rounding off this discussion, our Vice Chancellor at LUMS, Dr. Arshad Ahmed. Over to you, Dr. Chiktai. Hey. So we, we have on the panel with us uh, people who will perhaps enlighten us on learning how to unlearn because we have learned so much in our Pakistani context that perhaps the place to start is to unlearn some of that. Um, we have represented on, on this panel, in addition to Dr. Oakley, three organizations, two from the academic sphere, AKU and LAMS, and Jazz from the corporate sector. And what's common between these three is that in a highly dysfunctional um, ecosystem where it's very hard to maintain merit, these organizations have managed to have a national footprint. So when we talk about this larger challenge of how are we going to bring work such as what we saw in Dr. Oakley's talk, how are we going to transform not one generation but multiple generations that have gone uh, and are older now, of people who do not take that kind of an approach towards learning, um, what is the responsibility of some of these um, trailblazers who have managed to maintain quality and, and sustain impact in their domains? So the way we'll proceed is I'll ask particularly uh, Dr. Halai and Dr. Hamis to give us some uh, about Four, three to four minutes of what you have understood around enhancing a culture of learning. And uh, then we'll have a little bit of a debate around some themes that have come up already. And then we'll open it up for another round of questions. We end at six sharp, and that's when we'll have tea. So Dr. Hilaya, mm -hmm. over to you. Thank you very much, Mariam, uh, for giving me the first uh, open. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Barbara, for that wonderful presentation. Certainly, I learned something. And uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Friday afternoon, difficult to hold the audience attention. So the issue of learning is of great significance. And that is the point of discussion today. I will focus on teacher learning, because we heard from Barbara we heard, and we all as educators recognize that in the education system in Pakistan, um, Dr. Arshad started his comments by talking about our school education system. And when we talk about our school education system, classes in highly remote areas, disadvantaged classrooms, uh, under-resourced classrooms, who is the most critical determinant of quality in the classroom? It's the teacher. And how do you support and promote teacher learning? There has been a lot of research, a lot of research that has been done by the Aga Khan University academics in the context of Pakistan, and that research is available on our e-commons website. I, will, I don't have time to go into the details of that. But two or three key points I will make about how, um, how we can support teacher learning which is different from the traditional notion of an inset workshop where only direct instruction was given. And we heard Barbara say that direct instruction is not to be thrown out of the door, not to be thrown out of the window. It is useful, but along with other things. And what are those other things? So learning, um, so the researchers at the Aga Khan University have drawn on international research and created models of school university partnership where mentors, whom we call professional development teachers, qualified people, understanding, understanding teacher development and teacher learning, work in what is called, literature calls the third space. What is the third space? It is the space which where the knowledge, the expert knowledge of the university and the practitioner knowledge of the school comes together in a dialectic relationship. 
that's the space in which the teacher learning, the teachers, when they learn, they, they adapt and adopt the expert knowledge in a more contextually relevant and appropriate manner. So creating the third space is an important dimension. Uh, Mariam, you say, how do we expand it? The second feature, I would say, which we have learned from our research, and it also collaborates and builds on international research, is creating an environment for the teachers in the real world of schools and classrooms, an environment for teacher learning. Gone are the days when we say the teacher is the sage on the stage, and gone are the days when we say that once you have a degree, that, or degree as in kind of symbolizing some kind of knowledge and uh, education, then that's enough. That's not enough. It's the teacher's learning continue is an iterative process, to, and it continues along the continuum of the career. And for that, the, the mentors, the school-based mentors, create an environment of messaging, subtle and not so subtle, print, electronic, social media, whatever medium you use to create messaging to support teacher learning. And the third point in it that I want to make is that once you give those messages, once you create the third space, then you need to create routines for teachers to meet. Just to meet? No, not just to meet, but to meet and talk about teaching, to create thoughtful conversations, create an environment for thoughtful conversations where teachers are encouraged to try out new ideas into the classroom, talk about the impact of those new ideas on their students, and open up their classroom for peer critique and peer learning. Because there was a myth that what goes on in the black box of the classroom, nobody knows. But with these new approaches, you open up the black box of the classroom. So I'm getting signals from Mariam, and I will conclude there, that these are some of the approaches to support teacher learning and recognizing that when you take teacher learning in the real world of the classroom, then the learning is contextualized and much more meaningful and sustainable. Thank you so much for keeping it brief. Uh, Dr. Khamis, if you could also speak for about three to four minutes. And then, uh, Mr. Desir, I'll be coming to you from an employer's perspective. Okay, so thank you, uh, Anjum, and also thank you, Barbara. My uh, synapses were going, and I'll make sure I sleep tonight so that they actually grow a bit. Um, I just want to build, uh, and actually I was thinking about it, as you mentioned, Mariam, about unlearning and relearning. And I want to build on what uh, Anjum was saying and your uh, slide of effect size and um, particularly looking at teacher efficacy. And I was just wondering how many of us in the audience actually understood that term of the confidence of the teacher and how that translates into the student learning outcome. Um, and in higher education, um, Professor Arshad in his old life, uh, he had one before LUMS, uh, did a lot of work at, uh, at McMaster and elsewhere around helping our faculty to teach better so that they have this teacher efficacy that translates into learning. Um, and at AKU, we have, in the last five years or so, really started to concentrate and learn from others around how do we support our faculty, because faculty come into higher education with their content expertise, their PhD, their masters, but not necessarily, unlike in the school sector, any teaching expertise. <clears throat> and so we, we spend a lot of time um, actually unlearning what teachers necessarily have learned because teachers teach in the way they were taught. And that's not necessarily the most uh, effective. So over the last five years, we've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about with Arsha and others, uh, how, how is it that this happens and trying not to reinvent wheels and use best practice. And it's very surprising, we've just done a, a unit review of what uh, our networks are doing. And uh, what we have found that is in the last five years, 60% of our faculty are actually engaged 
in a voluntary way with the networks of teaching and learning. And I think, Arshad, we can say in Canada that's a lot less in terms of percentage reach. And we were trying to think about why did this happen. And building on what um, Anjum was saying, we know that faculty learn best from their peers. It's teachers learn best together. Planning is done well together. Um, and I think that's something that we have really tried to do. Uh, we've tried to get faculty to do that with other faculty, perhaps from different disciplines. And I was thinking about you know, uh, the dissonance that that creates, but also um, the space and the creativity that creates, because you're sort of outside of your comfort zone. So I think that's very much helped us. And also the whole area of, um, of ownership, that when we own what we learn or we teach, um, there seems to be just much more invested in it. And I think that's been another factor that has really um, helped teachers to learn and help hence students to learn. So I'm just going to stop there. Um, but those are some of the things that uh, we've been thinking about as to what makes us learn better. Very well said about uh, collaborative work. And, and in fact, I think uh, that's one of the crucial pieces that's missing. I remember uh, before my doctoral program, I volunteered at one of the schools that was an adopted school. And uh, there were two classrooms, uh, two staff rooms. One was for the teachers that were hired by the government, and one was for the teachers that were hired by the NGO. And there was no one in the classroom. Um, so I th and the students sat there without a teacher. So I think the question of being able to learn from one another is particularly pertinent uh, for, uh, for our context. But I will actually throw that over to Mr. Ali Nasir because you perhaps interface the most with this problem of um, the dearth of learning that's happened uh, in Pakistan as an employer. Um, I will ask you to first uh, put your comments around the nature of the challenge that you're faced with, and then also respond with how you envision yourself um, a leader of, um, of a large, uh, highly impactful corporate sector organization. How can you leverage that national footprint towards doing good, especially for the people who are not in this room? Because you, perhaps more than anyone else on the panel, interface with that diversity of demographic more than anyone else. Thank you, Mariam. Um, let me start off by saying it's a bit intimidating sandwich between so many doctors. Uh, I don't think I would even get a foot in the door in the doctoral program. Um, I'm going to start with something slightly controversial. Um, and I think one of the biggest reasons, one of the biggest constraints on um, us being able, on learning to learn, is because we're Pakistanis. Let me explain. How many people in this room think they can manage the Pakistan cricket team better than Sarfaraz? <laughs> how many people in this how many people in this room think they can manage the control the rupee dollar rate better than Imran Khan? The issue, I think, fundamentally, and it's a cultural thing, and, and I've had the benefit of living in a lot of countries, Pakistanis like to be experts at everything, even though they may not have the slightest clue. And and I mean, that's on the, that's on the um, casual side. But I think bringing it more to the serious level, uh, Mariam, to your question, we see that in the workplace every day. Uh, unfortunately, our, our formal system of education is not throwing up the kind of people um, or embedding the kind of skills they need now to navigate a very dynamic workforce. Uh, I run a telecommunications company, but we are seeing the change happening in such a dramatic way. And just to give you one statistic, January 2017, Jazz employed 10,500 people. Today we employ 3,500. Now it's not that the business is doing badly or you know cell phone business is growing, it's that the nature of the business that we're doing is changing fundamentally. And what we realized was that a lot of people who came up with certain skill sets um, felt pride in those skills and that expertise and that experience they'd acquired. 
but were very reluctant to learn anything new. You know, it's that old phenomenon of, um, I got here learning and doing this, so why should I change it now? Because I'm, I'm successful. And we've realized that that is probably one of the biggest constraints on progress, especially in the formal workforce. So Barbara, with, with uh, due respect to learning how to learn, I actually want to turn it on its head. And I think we should be unlearning to learn. Uh, I think Dr. Thamson, uh, Thamis mentioned that. We almost do not have in this modern day with technology the space to learn anymore. Yes, we'll use Barbara's techniques and we'll probably find that three megabits of space somewhere or the other to learn. But honestly, our minds are incredibly cluttered. And we've realized that as we're launching a program at Jazz where we're actually teaching our managers to empty the cup, to create space, to unlearn a lot of bad behaviors that we have learned over the years, and create some space to then learn these wonderful techniques and learn a bit more and learn how things are changing. So I think from an employer perspective, Mariam, um, that's kind of where we see things at. Uh, the second part of your question on, on digital, I think it's a no-brainer. Technology has now equipped us really to spread our tentacles far and wide. And, and that's something that previously you had a great teacher, he or she could talk to 40 students, 200 students. Now Barbara talks to 2.5 million students. And that's the power of technology. So with through collaboration, and that's what we're hoping to do, is bring Jazz's ability to connect people. Um, every third Pakistani cell phone user is a Jazz subscriber, so that puts me in an incredible position of power. Uh, but, but we want to use that for the progress of Pakistan. And that's really the hope and prayer. Uh, I will make that controversial statement some more controversial, that uh, currently we have all the poor kids with teachers and all the rich kids with tablets. But in the future, all the poor kids will have tablets and all the rich kids will have teachers. Because you can never replace a good teacher. And uh, tablets will only replace bad teaching. So I think that uh, the direct interface, whether that in teacher is you know, partially interfacing with you through technology, but completely eliminating the teacher, I think, will, will probably uh, probably be a more, much more complex thing to solve. But, but I take your um, point about the possibility if every third person is a jazz user, it means that more, more, a lot more people are internet users now in Pakistan and have mm -hmm. access. So I would then take this question to Dr. Arshad Ahmed that we are now at 30 years of LUMS and uh, you are a new fearless leader, at, uh, new vice chancellor. So what, is the, what does the next 30 years of LUMS look like? How does LUMS, can you take LUMS outside of LUMS? Should AKU take itself outside of AKU? And uh, what is the responsibility for these universities to become Asian universities, not just local Lahore University, Karachi University, Pakistani University? What, what is the, the functional operational plan for that? Uh, thanks for that really simple question. <laughs> Look in the crystal ball and tell you what's going to happen three decades ahead. Uh, let me just start first by uh, talking about connectivity just a second, which is uh, you have helped all these people to, uh, to make this event happen. I never got a chance to, to thank you and, and for Jazz to make uh, this event possible and many events more like these in our Disrupted series. So just a word of thanks to Jazz for making this happen. <laughs> Um, and our hosts from Aga Khan University, of course, uh, you know, learning spaces are important and uh, they're not easy to find and get. And, and you know, I, um, I, I've admired always as someone who's been in the sort of teaching and learning business, you referred to that in my previous career. Um, you know, it's very common in Canada, for example, every university has a teaching and learning center. And that's been going on since uh, mid 70s. Uh, Pakistan has actually, to my knowledge, only one, and, and that's at Aga Khan University. And that's a tribute to uh, the kind of leadership you've shown in faculty development. Faculty development is a normal thing. It's a part of the architecture of teaching and learning in other places, but it seems to be uh, anom an, uh, you know, an anomaly here in Pakistan. And so for leading uh, the way uh, ahead in focusing on how 
people can sort of look in the mirror and say, here's where I'm at in my teaching, and I've got a ways to go to continuously improve, obviously helps our students. But I am going to be controversial, as you've asked me to, and it's not a debate really, but I think we're missing the point, all of us, including me, in my uh, 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 new role, is that, you know, if we think about it, we, and especially when I think about it in Pakistan, um, we, we're just missing the magnitude of the challenge and the opportunity in terms of teaching and learning. And keep saying it's somebody else's problem and not our problem. You know, uh, we've all got our um, either disciplines. If you're an academic, you live in your discipline. You, your whole world is kind of shaped by your discipline. And that's a silo. Barbara spoke about that. You can have geniuses, but uh, you won't get a lot of common sense in terms of the wicked problems that we face, challenging, persistent problems. Geniuses have a certain lens, a very valuable lens, but it doesn't solve the society's problems. You can't just have them make those types of decisions. So we can say the same thing about universities. Um, universities, as I mentioned to you, are actually making a difference in the lives of about a quarter million people. That's not a lot of people. In, I mean, Karachi has two-thirds of Canada living right in one city. Uh, and that's the second biggest country, at least in terms of space. So uh, we, we have to step back. We say uh, students who are in school and we want to help their teachers. Of course we want to help their teachers. But I, I mentioned the numbers are 25 million young people are not in school out of grade one to five. Whose problem is that? Now, clearly that's not in my job definition. When I signed up to come to LUMS, nobody said, hey, go help the primary sector and figure this out. But I think we have all done in progressive ways to transform the lives of young people. We do the best we can with you know, the folks that we can uh, deal with. I, I will say at LUMS, for example, I'm sure most of you don't know this, that we got applications uh, from 162 different villages, towns, and cities from across the country. And if you uh, look at our national outreach program, this is a program where uh, we actually scout for students in those villages and in those out outlying areas, in the rural areas, because they're smart kids there too. And we bring them to LUMS for a month. This summer it's going on as we speak to allow them to be able to enable them to write tests so they can get into universities like AKU and, and to uh, LUMS. And uh, one out of 10 students in our intake is an NOP student who, by the way, gets supported for everything, for their uh, boarding, lodging, tuition, materials, everything is paid for. One out of three students in, in LUMS is getting financial, significant financial support. But that's, in totality, four and a half thousand students. And while we can, I can say a lot of wonderful things about the 13,000 LUMS alumni who have done amazing things around the world, we've got a Pakistani problem. And, and to, back to what you said, what role can we play? And I'm starting to think, and Barbara, you have inspired us to think, maybe it's time to go directly to the students. You've got to go straight to the learner. And yes, we want to help and support teachers, but you've got to give them a chance to, to learn the way they can, the way we can uh, show them ways in which they can learn. So many efforts I'm learning uh, around the country where people want to do exactly that. But we have to do it with evidence. We have to do it with science. We have to do it, as you were saying earlier on, with uh, um, you know, uh, pedagogy that has been tested and retested and, and there's a lot of experience behind that. So I think the challenge is back squarely on us. What role are we playing at LUMS to answer your question? I hope we are a university that um, uh, really is a national university in the true sense of doing everything we can for every sector in whatever ways we can, uh, including the primary sector. And it may be through the beginnings of a course like Learning How to Learn, which we make accessible to all, that that's the way we go. So that's a long answer to a short question. So I'll ask you, 
Can we consider this uh, an official commitment from you to launch LUMS X, which is going to perhaps be inaugurated with Barbara's course? Uh, yes, you can. I, right. I made that That's commitment good. yesterday. <laughs> Um, I, will ma I made that commitment actually in Islamabad where uh, we had this dreadful, on the budget day, we were, we were told about budget cuts everywhere and higher education budget has gone down by 50%. But we were also told there are hundreds of millions of dollars coming from the World Bank, from DFID and from other places to support education. And so we have to make commitments in what our role is in that broad universe of education and so I will commit again publicly, uh, we are creating, following in your footsteps, the LUMS Learning Institute, which is a teaching and learning center at LUMS. We are also committing LUMS X, where the first course that will be launched with uh, hopefully partners like Jazz, who are already encouraging us to go in that direction, uh, to have a, a massively open online course and available, accessible to everyone. And we will uh, have a kid's version too. We will not only In have a kid's two. version, we're going to have a baby version uh, for, from grades one to five. This is the kind of ambition uh, that uh, and expectations that I think we should all raise to each other so we can make this happen uh, sooner rather than later. And with the gratitude to Dr. Oakley for allowing us uh, the giving us permission and the, to use her intellectual property for free. And that's... Uh, he gets the applause. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for a very heartening discussion. We're going to open it up to questions. And I'm going to make a second attempt at trying to take more than one question at a time. And uh, again, a reminder, a question cannot be a comment disguised as a question. Uh, so it, should, it must be short, it must be an actual question with a question mark at the end, your name and affiliation at the start. Please, yes. Uh, please, can you touch upon the scaffolding? It was in one of your slides. Okay. And Thank I thoroughly you. enjoyed the lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, other questions? Uh, someone who is not already asked. Yes. Yes, you. Take the mic. Flip learning. Okay. okay. Flip learning is one method that the students, uh, that people use to engage students in the class. But I find that the biggest challenge is to make the student watch the video or the, read the material before they come to class. They are more comfortable after the teacher has given the lecture. So is there any research or, any, or is there any observation that you have made that is flip learning effective or not? Okay, thank you. So one question on scaffolding, the other one on the, on the flipped classroom. And a third question from someone who doesn't have a question of Dr. Oakley. Yes, please. I'm Dr. Ifan Hadar from IOBM. Uh, my question is, uh, I saw too many times uh, I heard about the word unlearn. Can we unlearn anything? Or it's just the synapses uh, saying that such and such route, not a good one. Okay, so that's a disguised question for Dr. Oakley. Uh, is, Dr. is it Arshad, possible to unlearn something? Dr. Ashad, I would like to say congratulations to you because you started this program at primary level and school level. And in the last meeting, I suggested this thing with the due respect to Dr. Uh, Farooq of IBA and Dr. Irfan Hadar as well. Basically, we should start in Karachi, all over Pakistan at school level. Sir, Thank uh, you. with due respect, uh, my question is now. You said, from your, uh, uh, basically at the back of the program from jazz. I believe in this thing that speed of a leader is the speed of a team. I'm in teaching for the last about more than 25 years and I saw and I observe our students are marvelous. They really want to learn, they are wonderful. Please clap for students. So my question is to you, if you feel that they are unable to learn, the people who have, you have hired Honestly speaking, I would like to offer my services that I can train them. Thank you very much. If you are agree, I'm agree, agree okay. for that. Thank you. 
So now that we've had some comments as well, we have only a couple of minutes. So Dr. Oakley can respond to the three questions that were raised, and then we have to end sharply after that. So scaffolding, flipped classroom, and is it possible to? No, I'm sorry, I am the moderator, not anybody else. There's only one. Maybe next time someone else can be the moderator. But uh, please, Dr. Oakley. And I would really appreciate if the crowd doesn't just jump in, and I'm trying to discourage that, and let's just keep it civil. Okay. Now, um, what was number three again? Was the third question is: Is it possible to unlearn anything and do the synapses actually unlearn? Okay. Can you grow and then ungrow? So like that. that was such an interesting question. So um, let's say, okay, I'm used to driving in the U.S., so I come here to Pakistan. Is it possible for me to unlearn driving on the other side of the border? It's really hard. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, my, even if I have driven here for six months, my natural reaction in an, an extreme quick situation is going to be to do the wrong thing. So um, the older you get, the harder it is to unlearn things. But on the other hand, you, you, you have this fountain of wisdom from the things you have learned. So I think your mind is a little more subtle or supple when you're younger. You can unlearn a little more easily. But uh, you know, the more you know a subject, the, the harder it is to kind of change your mind about a subject or to learn something that's related but different. For example, for me, I'm trying to learn Spanish. It keeps coming out in Russian. And, uh, it, it, and it's hard to unlearn. So. But unlearning is something that's part of learning. So we, it's a good thing to do to keep yourself flexible. Uh, sorry. It, 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 um, and I couldn't agree more. So his point was unlearning is part of learning. And exactly Unlearning right. is part of learning. That's a good point. So uh, um, on the flipped classroom, how do you motivate students to not be handheld? Because one of the teachers here said that her, her students are resistant to doing the work on their own. So I do that in several ways. For one thing, the videos I make for my flipped classrooms are funny. So, and it's not like everything is funny. It's like every five, six minutes, there's something weird and kind of funny. So those students are just, they're like rats in a cage. They'll keep pressing the lever to see where the funny stuff is. So you know, just adding a little bit of humor, what can, how can you do that? As long as in the US, we are able to take a little snippet from YouTube or something like that, or something funny, a little piece from a movie, and you know, all of a sudden they're watching Bruce Carey and, uh, uh, you know, and, I mean, uh, Jim Carey and Bruce Almighty, you know, I've got the power. And it, it, it's, it's just kind of wacky, but it keeps their attention. I test every single week. So they have to have, they have two hours in the classroom, two hours at home, and they're expected to watch those videos. And when they come into the classroom, they're tested on that video. So it's not like, oh yeah, now we're gonna learn it in class. It's like, ah, guess what? You're gonna be tested right now. So frequent testing prevents procrastination and helps keep them motivated to learn the material. And more elaboration on the concept of scaffolding. So I, I'm, I'm just a little bit, um, I'm not quite grasping the, the, what was scaffolding in relation to? If you can... For one slide, you Oh, so that was um, from John Hattie's work? Yes. So scaffolding means, for example, let's say you have a, a complex uh, problem that involves um, Maxwell's theories. And you want your students to be able to solve these equations. They are pretty tough. So the first thing you might do to scaffold a student is to, to walk them through how to solve a problem. Then you might sort of have a partially work, you know, first you might have a partially work. So you're scaffolding by showing them how to approach the solutions to these problems. Um, so John Sweller's work on cognitive load has a lot on scaffolding. So I invite you to explore that. Okay, so um, with that, 
one final note of feedback. Yeah. Okay. Um, we would like to thank particularly Khan University and LAMS because when I'm one of the two co-founders for the LAMS School of Education and when it was just a project, I uh, reached out to the LAMS, the AKU ID, and they truly have been the, f the flag bearer of education research for the last 30 years. It was really a older brother, younger brother relationship, or should I say older sister, younger sister relationship. Let's keep it gender parity. Um, but, and I was surprised that such kind of a relationship had just not happened before. You know, LAMS and IBA would be two great business schools, but they won't talk to each other. They'll talk to Harvard at the same time in a web, a web uh, webinar that's being hosted by HEC. But, so I think the spirit of collaboration is really beautiful. And, uh, and this collaboration also across the, uh, within the civil society, between the corporate sector and the not-for-profit sector. So this event, the fact that Jazz has, this is beyond CSR. This is really beyond CSR for the CEO to have taken out this time and to have traveled with us and to have made this event possible. Um, I think that that is the spirit of collaboration that we really want to take forward. And for that, I am truly grateful and humbled to be on this panel moderating with, with all of you. And thank you, Barbara, for, for your time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chuktai. I do want to say, arguably, one of the hardest jobs, leading conversations. Um, and um, thank you, everyone. Um, I would just like to now uh, invite our friends from the AKU to say a few words. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arshad Ahmed. Thank you, Lums. Uh, it has been a pleasure to host you at Khan University. Um, I'm Azra Naseem, Associate Director, Network of Blended and Digital Learning at the Khan University and a faculty member at the Institute for Educational Development, where we had some initial interactions uh, with you. Um, again, it's been um, an absolute pleasure to um, have you, Barbara, at Khan University and Dr. Arshad Ahmed, and we hope to um, have you over again um, at the Khan University. Um, as a token of our appreciation, uh, may I please request our, um, so our Vice Provost, uh, Professor Anjum Halai, to please present um, a gift to our speaker, Dr. Barbara. So, uh, Anjum, so this is our Ajra. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, could I please invite uh, uh, our associate uh, vice provost quality teaching and learning, Dr. Tashmeen Kamis, to present our token of thanks to our panelists today. Uh, may I invite uh, Vice Chancellor Lums, Dr. Arshad Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Arshad, for bringing Barbara to AKU Karachi. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Dr. Mariam Chuktai, Associate Dean of Education. Thank you for coming back to AKU. And now you're part of our family. Um, and Mr. Um, Ali Nasir, Chief Corporate and Enterprise Officer, Jazz. Thank you very much for supporting this event. Um, and a very big thank you to all um, the people in the audience uh, you, for your active participation and for your very interesting and challenging questions. Um, because this uh, event has been 
on Facebook and has been available online. And it is possible for you to continue interacting with Barbara through her MOOC. So I hope that these conversations will continue. And some of you might get answers to the tough questions you've been asking. I, I thank just have one last yeah. comment. I really want you to take a moment and uh, thank the incredible LUMS team that has made this happen, particularly Nozat Kamran for leading their advancement, and each one of her volunteers uh, who have really worked very hard for this. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and um, we will close the session now. And uh, there's tea um, at the pond side. So please, um, come. we can all move to the pool side there. Thank you very much.